Pleasure. Mark, I'm pretty sure that's the first time we've ever walked out to dance music. <laughs> well, I did think about holding hands, but <laughs> didn't think that would come off right. <laughs> well, it is my honor to be here with Senator Cruz. We're going to have a short discussion about the Constitution. How many of you support the Constitution? <laughs> so we're not at the uh, DNC event here, that's obvious. Senator Cruz, I think yeah. the smell would be somewhat different. <laughs> yes. He means pot, of course. Um, uh, studied ambiguity is okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're one of the leading constitutionalists, not just in the Senate, but in the country. And one of the problems we have in this country today is so much of what we do is not within the constitutional construct. Um, you have introduced an amendment to the Constitution to place term limits on members of Congress. So tell us why you did it and tell us about your amendment. Well, Mark, I think it's one of the first and biggest steps we can take to actually drain the swamp. Yeah. You look across this country, people are fed up with Washington. This election was the American people saying, enough already with the corruption in Washington. And it's both parties. It's Democrats and Republicans who have been here too long, who become captured by this city. And, and if you look at President Trump campaigned on draining the swamp, on term limits, you look at congressional leaders. We've got majorities in both houses. I think we ought to demonstrate that we heard the voters bring up term limits pass it, send it to the states for ratification. And what's amazing is the support for this, it cuts across in this polarized time. You get super majorities of Republicans, of Democrats, of independents, who all say, throw the bums out. And we ought to listen. Now, it takes time to get these sorts of things Past because you've got to develop support among the American people and so forth. So what should the people in this room and across the country do? Because obviously you have an entrenched ruling class and they're not going to say, yeah, let me vote myself out. So what, how, how, what do we do? We put pressure on them? How should we handle this? Look, hold us accountable. Uh, there is an incredible power, the men and women in this room, the men and women of CPAC, the grassroots, have the ability to get people's attention, to hold our elected officials accountable, hold every one of us accountable. Look, the message that I am conveying to President Trump, to the cabinet, to leaders in both houses is real simple. Let's do what we promised. Let's deliver on the promises. And if we do that, we'll win at the ballot box. And if we don't, the people will hold us accountable for that too. Let me ask you about the courts. We saw what the Ninth Circuit did or a panel in the Ninth Circuit on an executive order that, wa that once the executive order was modified, really it wasn't even a controversial executive order from a constitutional point of view, and then you have three judges who did what they did. The other day we had the Fourth Circuit basically tear the guts out of the Second Amendment, yep. reject the Heller decision in the Supreme Court. So the Gorsuch nomination is important. How do we get our hands around all this? Well, you're right. You, you look at judicial activism, and those are two great examples, the Ninth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit decision in recent weeks. If, if you look at the Ninth Circuit, it's, it's based in California. It's long been the most liberal court of appeals in the country. If you look at the decision of the Ninth Circuit and the decision of the California District Court, uh, that, uh, actually the Washington District Court that's, that struck down, that enjoined the President's order, both decisions are utterly lawless. You know, the reason the Constitution gives judges life tenure is so they can be independent of political pressures and follow the law. I've read the district court decision. I've read the Court of Appeals decision. They don't even cite the controlling federal law. By statute, Congress has given the president the authority to suspend immigration, any class of immigration, if he deems it in the national interest. Now, any judge that was actually being a judge would begin with the statute, would look to the precedents, would interpret it. They don't even mention the statute. They just say, we don't like this policy, 
and they're engaged in legislation. You take the Fourth Circuit decision, upholding Maryland's laws on so-called assault weapons and large uh, capacity magazines. The Fourth Circuit used to be the most conservative court in the country. I started, started my career as a law clerk of the Fourth Circuit, and it was 20 years ago, the Fourth Circuit was tremendous. It was dedicated to protecting our constitutional rights. The Fourth Circuit now, they invented this new test for the Second Amendment, and here's what their test said. The Second Amendment doesn't protect a weapon if it would be useful in a military context. <laughs> this test isn't just sort of questionable. It isn't just a little bit out there. It is nuts. The Second Amendment was designed explicitly to protect weapons that would be useful in a military context. If we were living back in 1789, your musket would be really useful in a military conflict. If you were called up to service, they said, bring your musket. And indeed, the first Congress passed a law. You want to know the first gun control law in America? First Congress passed a law mandating that all able-bodied men must own a musket. Amen. Under the that, force, that's an individual mandate we could live with. There, there you go. That's uh, <laughs> under the Fourth Circuit's test. They say, well, gosh, if it would be useful in a military context, in the Second Amendment, it's not about hunting. It's not about target shooting. It's about protecting your home and your family and your life. So under the Fourth Circuit's test, the only things that are protected are things that are not useful in a military context. So apparently the Second Amendment protects feather dusters. <laughs> you have a right to have a feather duster. If anyone breaks in, you can make sure they're really clean as they're robbing your house. This is lawless. And, and it's why after eight years of Obama, there, there, there are few, if anything, more important than putting principled constitutionalists on the Supreme Court. The Gorsuch nomination is important. It matters, and mark my words, Judge Gorsuch will be confirmed. Let's, uh, let's talk about separation of powers. We have this massive administrative state, yep. this fourth branch of government within the executive branch. The executive branch does more legislating than the legislative branch. And they're pushing out three, 4,000 laws, regulations every year. Isn't there a law that Congress passed itself, the Reins Act, yep. that empowers itself to do something about this? Well, th that should be one of the singular priorities of this new Congress and of this new administration is reining in the out of control regulatory state. The Reins Act, uh, would require Congress to approve any regulation that would have an impact of greater than $100 million on the economy. Now, you want to talk about a basic common sense step. If the federal government is going to cost $100 million or more of your jobs going away, at a minimum, the people who are elected by the people ought to have to vote and say, yes, I support taking away your job, or no, I don't support taking away your job. And part of the regulatory state, you know, what the, what the framers understood was, was accountability. I mean, the Constitution is brilliant for accountability, for posing factions against, against each other, to fight amongst themselves in government, which protects our liberty, but also in ensuring that decision-making is made by those that the people can hold accountable. The regulatory state now lets politicians wipe their hands and say, hey, it's not my fault. It just came from these bureaucrats who work for nobody and are accountable to nobody. And, and I will say one of the things that I have encouraged President Trump to do, and, and, and I'm optimistic about this, is to take on directly the regulatory state, to take it on to fire bureaucrats. And, and what I've encouraged President Trump and Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and by the way, let me just repeat that again, Attorney General Jeff Sessions. I, 
I, I just like making Chuck Schumer twitch. <laughs> But what I have urged them to do is put together a sophisticated, serious legal strategy to take on the regulatory state. Now, you'll be sued. You'll end up in the Ninth Circuit. You'll end up with activist judges trying to protect the regulatory state. But if you look at executive power, we, we saw eight years of Obama. And what Obama did wrong with executive power is he tried to change the law. He tried to ignore the law, and under the Constitution, Article I, all legislative authority is vested in Congress, and the President doesn't have the authority to change the law or ignore the law, and that's what Obama tried to do. But under Article II, all executive power is vested in one President of the United States. The regulatory state is Congress's efforts to undermine the President's authority. And my hope is we will see a president use that constitutional authority to rein in the uncontrollable, unelected bureaucrats and to rescind regulations. I hope we see the waters of the United States rule rescinded. And reining in the regulatory state would have a massive impact on economic freedom going forward. Let me... Uh, impeachment. Impeachment is a constitutional function. Yes. Uh, the left keeps talking about impeachment. I mean, they were talking about impeachment before the inauguration. Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, I think impeaching Obama in January probably would have been a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so would retroactive impeachment be unconstitutional? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but it'd be fun. <laughs> But let me ask you this question. Do the Democrats understand they need to control the House of Representatives to impeach somebody? Uh, you know... <laughs> the Democrats right now are living in an alternative universe. I, I, The week after the election, I was back at the Capitol, was in an elevator at the Capitol with a well-known liberal Democrat who was simply staring ahead in this complete stupor. <laughs> and that hadn't changed. <laughs> they and, all look like that. And, and, and they are in denial and they're angry. I mean, you and I were talking backstage before this, the anger on the left, I've never seen anything like mm -mm. this. I mean, they're right now opposing everything. Democrats in the Senate are filibustering absolutely everything. This is the longest we've been. The cabinet is still not confirmed. This is the longest we've been since George Washington without confirming a cabinet. They're filibustering everything. We voted a couple of weeks ago on approving the journal. Now, Mark, I'm going to confess, I have no idea what the hell that is. <laughs> I've, I've never voted. I voted yes. I hope yes was the right vote. <laughs> Approving the journal is the most mundane procedural step. It is always done by unanimous consent. I didn't know we did that until they objected to it and said, no, you got to have a full Senate vote. Everyone come down to approve the journal. What that means, if this continues, and from, from the left, their base, there's a technical term for their base. Moscow. I was going a different direction, which was bat crap crazy. <laughs> right now, Democratic senators are more scared of their base than they are of the voters. Mm. Democrat, a, a liberal Democrat told me a couple of weeks ago, said, listen, we're afraid of being primaried. The Democrats took at the lesson of this election that Hillary was too moderate. And so their lesson is they need more Bernie Sanders, more Elizabeth Warren. That's where Senate Democrats are. What that means is I think it is likely they will continue to oppose everything. Now that means for us, the answer can't be okay, then they shut down the Congress. They prevent us from doing anything, so we need to look at tools that can get things done despite a democratic filibuster, and there are three main tools. First is confirmation, 
And by the way, I'll do this again many times since January 20th, I have raised a glass and toasted Harry Reid. Because Harry Reid employed the so-called nuclear option, broke the Senate rules to change the Senate rules, lowered the threshold from confirmation from 60 vote to 51 votes, and it is a direct result of Harry Reid that we now have the most conservative cabinet in decades. And, and so if I can be a little presumptuous, Mark, let me on behalf of CPAC, thank Harry Reid. <laughs> Harry Reid, thank you for Attorney General Jeff Sessions. <laughs> and also we should be thanking Harry Reid for EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt. For Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. And very, very soon I look forward to thanking Harry Reid for Supreme Court Justice Gorsuch. Should we thank Keith Ellison too? Who is likely to be the next, hold on, who's likely to be the next chairman of the DNC and I'm sure the vast majority of Americans, given his background with Farrakhan, will be very excited about that. Should we get behind him at CPAC? What do you say? I, listen, I will commend the Democrats for one thing. If they name Keith Ellison as the head of the, the DNC, then I'll commend them for truth and advertising. Let me ask you this question. There is a battle somewhat over Gorsuch. Mm -hmm. But when there's another vacancy, yes. how much nuttier can they get? Because the next vacancy, they're going to say, belongs to them. And so, you know, we can only have so many people on the court who actually are faithful to the Constitution. So, <laughs> what steps might they take? Well, listen, this vacancy right now is defense. We're replacing Justice Scalia. Both you and I know, knew Justice Scalia very well. He was extraordinary. He was one of a kind. <laughs> By the way, I, I have to tell a quick Scalia story just, just in, in honor of the great jurist, uh, which is in, in the early to mid-1980s, then Judge Antonin Scalia was on the D.C. Circuit. The other prominent conservative was Robert Bork. Reagan was in the White House. Everyone knew one or the other, either Scalia or Bork was likely to get the next vacancy. They didn't know who it was going to be. And Scalia was walking through the parking lot at the D.C. Circuit. And he came to the elevator. And there were two U.S. Marshals who stopped him and said, I'm sorry, sir, we're holding this elevator for the Attorney General of the United States. Scalia pushed past them stepped into the elevator, pushed the button, and as the door's closing, he said, you tell Ed Meese, Bob Bork doesn't wait for anyone. <laughs> <clears throat> and in 86, Reagan nominated Antonin Scalia. <laughs> the Scalia seat is defense we're not going to get any better than Justice Scalia. The best we can do is preserve constitutional victories like upholding the Second Amendment, like protecting religious liberty. But we're not going to get any better. This summer, I think we'll have another Supreme Court vacancy this summer. If that happens, as much as the left is crazy now, they will go full Armageddon meltdown. Because the next vacancy is where we have the ability to get back and restore our basic constitutional protections. And, and, and to, give, to, to give an indication of just how much impact common sense policies can have, let me actually shift for a second as we wrap up from the Constitution to, to a basic priority, enforcing the border. 
So this week I was down at the border, I was down in McAllen, joined the border patrol, d did a air patrol up in the plains, went, went, did, rode in a gunboat up and down the Rio Grande, joined them on a midnight ride along as, as they were enforcing the border. And, and let me break a little bit of news here. You know what the border patrol told me in the Rio Grande Valley sector? That since inauguration day, illegal crossings have dropped 50%. Now, oddly enough, you and I have not seen that on the six o'clock news. Somehow reporters aren't reporting it. I asked them, I said, look, why is that? Border Patrol agents said they didn't know, but they assumed it was because with the new administration, they understood we'd have an administration that would finally, finally, finally enforce the laws. And I want to commend the men and women at CPAC. As activists fighting for liberty, fighting for the Constitution, y'all are incredibly important. You are incredibly important, number one, in shocking and terrifying the mainstream media. Which really should be done on a daily basis. But also on holding us accountable. We have the opportunity for this to be an historic Congress, the most productive Congress in decades. This year, in 2017, we should repeal Obamacare, <laughs> confirm a strong conservative to the Supreme Court, <laughs> and pass fundamental tax reform, ideally a flat tax. And let me add one more thing to that list. We ought to pass the legislation that I've introduced with Lindsey Graham to defund the United Nations until they reverse their anti-Israel resolution. Okay. And if we do that, if we do that, 2017 will be an historic milestone year. And so what I'm encouraging President Trump and the cabinet and congressional leaders to do is let's keep our promises. Let's do what we said we would do. And that's what each and every one of you can hold all of us accountable for. We have to go. It's been a pleasure being with you, Senator. It's a the pleasure. great one. Yeah. It's a pleasure being with all of you. God bless you.